Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Hidden Histories, Highlighting Untold Stories from the Past. I am Ronnie Curry, Booklist Associate Editor, Books for Youth. Before we begin, I'd like to go over some technical details. To resize the slides, look to the magnifying glass icons located to the left of the slides. There, you can increase or decrease the size and select how you'd like the slides to appear. If you lose audio or would like to change the way you're connected to it, look at the bottom of your screen for a circle with three dots. Clicking that icon will open a menu with an audio connection option. If you have any issues during the webinar, click on FAQ Webinars in the drop-down menu at the top of your WebEx screen to view a PDF with answers to commonly asked webinar questions. If you're in the audience, you are in listen-only mode, but we do welcome questions. On the right side of your screen is a control panel with an area at the bottom for Q&A. Simply type your question into the field and click Send. Attendees will be able to see questions asked during the webinar as well as the answers provided. A link to today's slides was sent directly to you from WebEx at the start of the webinar. But you can also download the slides at any time by copying the URLs on this screen into your web browser. Later this afternoon, all attendees will receive an email containing a link to today's slide presentation along with the certificate of completion. All right, we have a wonderful program today and our moderator this afternoon will be Polly Ken. Polly is the Reader's Services Coordinator at the Lawrence Public Library in Lawrence, Kansas, and she is fairly certain that leisure reading and a nice cuppa will save humanity. In early 2015, she launched the Book Squad Reader's Advisory Team and has written and presented on how to start a Reader's Advisory Revolt at your library on a dime. She is a member of the Booklist Advisory Board, the Library Reads Board, and a co-host of the excellent Book Squad podcast. It's great to have you here today, Polly, so please take it away. Thanks so much, Ronnie. Hi, everyone. Um, I got a chance to read these books this month, and I tell you, they are fantastic. Um, I'm so excited to be able to introduce these authors to you today. Um, we'll be hearing from Stacy Lee, author of The Downstairs Girl, Ruta Sapetis, author of The Fountains of Silence, Julie Berry, author of Lovely War, and Rachel DeWaskin, author of Someday We Will Fly. First up, you'll hear from Stacy Lee. Stacy Lee is the critically acclaimed author of the novels Under a Painted Sky and Outrun the Moon and the winner of the Penn Center USA Literary Award for Young Fiction. She is a fourth generation Chinese American and a founding member of We Need Diverse Books. Born in Southern California, she graduated from UCLA and then got her law degree at UC Davis King Hall. She lives with her family outside San Francisco. You can visit Stacy at stacyhlee.com or follow her on Twitter at Stacy Lee Author. Thank you, Polly, and thank you, Booklist, uh, for having me here. I'm going to tell you about The Downstairs Girl. The Downstairs Girl is about a Chinese girl in 1890 Atlanta, Georgia, who lives in a secret basement underneath a print shop along with her adopted father. Jo Kwan is fired from her job as a milliner's apprentice for being a softbox. To make matters worse, she learns by eavesdropping through the speaking tube that connects the secret basement to the print shop that the printer and his family are in danger of being evicted because their newspaper, The Focus, has been losing subscriptions. So not only is Jo out of a job, but she might be out of a home too. So Jo proposes through an anonymous letter to the printer's son who she considers her dearest friend, even though he has no idea she exists, that she start an advice column called Dear Miss Sweetie, an edgy, provocative column to address some of the problems she sees in society. Not only would it get 
give the focus a financial boost, but it would allow her, someone who has always repressed her individuality, to finally have a voice. She gets a job working as a lady's maid to the daughter of one of the most influential families in town. That gives her an insider's look at the current issues of the day. As the column goes 19th century viral and folks clamor to unmask her, Jo struggles to balance the many moving pieces in her life, specifically when she stumbles onto a mystery involving the identity of her real parents and is put in the crosshairs of one of Atlanta's most notorious criminals. So I had always wanted to write a story set in the South, which I think offers such a great opportunity to explore our very complicated natures. You have a society that emphasizes manners and genteel living, but one with an undeniable history of racism. So when I learned that the Chinese came to the South after the Civil War to replace the field slaves, I knew it was time to write my Southern story. The Chinese were considered prime specimens for field labor. It was thought they were hardworking, could withstand extreme temperatures, and that they had good compliant temperaments. This shows an artist's rendition of Chinese laborers crossing the icy Missouri River, probably having just come off building the Transcontinental Railroad. They were either going to work on the construction of railroads in Texas or to work on plantations in the South. You might notice the artist has depicted them as looking kind of all the same, same height, same hat. Everyone's carrying their belongings on these poles. Um, they're all marching in uh, obediently in single line formation. And this next picture shows them working on a sugar plantation near New Orleans. People had a, one, a very one dimensional view of the Chinese and they were very surprised to find that the Chinese didn't like being treated subhuman any more than the enlisted and they ran away or somehow left to start their own lives, often marrying into the local populations and starting businesses of their own. In fact, the Chinese found they could occupy the space between white and black. While white-owned businesses refused to serve blacks, the Chinese grocery stores, for example, served both communities. So they eked out a living as best they could. I got the idea of giving my protagonist, Joe, an underground home after my in-laws, who are Canadian, told me about a place called Moose Jaw up in Saskatchewan. There's this underground network of tunnels in Moose Jaw where Chinese railroad workers had been living in secret. They were facing a lot of hostility during the day from whites who blamed them for the loss of their jobs, among other things. And so the solution was to live out of sight. I did a little research uh, and found that the same thing had happened here in the US. Excavation for a construction project would begin as what happened in Oklahoma City. And there's a picture of that. Or potholes would appear in the street, which is what happened in Pendleton, Oregon. And they'd find underground civilizations containing remnants like teapots and incense, things that were distinctly Chinese. So the two ideas came together. What if I put a Chinese girl underground in the South? I thought it would be a good analogy for someone who doesn't quite have a voice in society and has to keep herself hidden away metaphorically and physically. So that's the downstairs girl. Okay, next up, next up is Ruta Sepetis. Ruta Sepetis is an internationally acclaimed number one New York Times bestselling author of historical fiction published in over 60 countries and 40 languages. Sepetis is considered a crossover novelist as her books are read by both teens and adults worldwide. Her novels, Between Shades of Grey, Out of the Easy, and Salt to the Sea have won or been shortlisted for more than 40 book prizes and are included on more than 60 state award lists. Between Shades of Grey was adapted into the film Ashes in the Snow, and her other novels are currently in development for TV and film. Winner of the Carnegie Medal, Ruta is passionate about the power of history and literature to foster global awareness and connectivity. She has presented to NATO, to the European Parliament, in the United States Capitol, 
and at embassies worldwide. Ruta was born and raised in Michigan and now lives with her family in Nashville, Tennessee. Follow her on Twitter at Twitter at Ruta Sapetis and Instagram at Ruta Sapetis Author. Ruta? Thank you so much, Polly, and hi, everyone. And yes, I'm so passionate about history and hidden history. And I'm also super nervous after that, woo, that intro. Thank you so much. No pressure. Um, and I'm thrilled to be here um, with all of you and particularly with all these amazing authors. We were talking about it on the practice session. And this is, I wish we could all tour together. That would be um, amazing. Um, so I'm here to talk about The Fountains of Silence, my new novel, my fourth novel. Um, it comes out October 1st. I am equal parts excited and terrified. The setting is 1957 in Madrid, Spain. And the story, it follows 18-year-old uh, Daniel Matheson, who's the son of an oil family from Dallas, Texas. And he comes to Madrid the summer after his senior year with his parents. And in Madrid, he meets Ana, a Spanish girl working at the hotel. And together, they embark upon this journey that unravels some of the deepest secrets and darkest silence of the Franco dictatorship in Spain. So we have an American boy and a Spanish girl, and they're desperate to connect and understand one another, but they're fenced by fear and silence and circumstance. So that's where we begin. Um, and as I said, Fountains is set uh, in post-Spanish Civil War Spain during the dictatorship of Francisco Franco. And when I mentioned to some people that I was writing a novel about an American in Spain during the Franco period, a few people said, they said, oh my gosh, I love Spain, I visited. You know, remind me, who's Franco? And for some of us, um, the history of Spain is a bit more elusive and it's nuanced and it's complex. Uh, and I so desperately wanted to give um, a balanced portrayal. So to understand that, I had to spend many years um, studying and, and during the Franco dictatorship, um, he ruled for 36 years. So imagine you're living in Spain during the dictatorship. There's no freedom of speech. Um, you know, some books are banned, so there's no freedom of the press, uh, no right to protest, no freedom of religion. Uh, so no First Amendment rights as we know them. Um, all the textbooks uh, were written and issued by the government. And in terms of women, um, women didn't have equal rights. If, if a woman couldn't have, an unmarried woman or even a married woman couldn't have a passport or a bank account without uh, her husband's permission. And some of the teachings also told women and young women, um, you know, don't pretend to be equal to men. And for the families who opposed Franco during the Spanish Civil War, some of those families were particularly vulnerable. There were whispers that um, babies of Spanish Republican families uh, were being stolen and they were being gifted and sold to Francoist families. So that's a bit of, of the setting. But those of you who have read some of my books, you know that uh, my three previous books, they all have a connection to my personal family history. So I could write those books from the inside out, but I am not Spanish. Um, and I have no connection to the country. And I found myself like constantly asking, what right do we have to history other than our own? And because the history of Spain is so nuanced and complex, I so desperately wanted to, to present a balanced portrayal. So I had to, to find a way into the story. And after the Spanish Civil War um, and after World War II, Spain became pretty isolated. Uh, and, and there was such poverty in Spain. And during that time, in the 50s, the U.S. decided that they needed a strategic position in Europe against the Soviets. Well, at the same time, Franco needed an influx of money into Spain. So the U.S. embarked upon business with Francisco Franco. 
And Franco allowed the, um, uh, the Americans to open two military bases in Spain. Um, Franco allowed the Texas oil barons to drill for oil, and he allowed the Hollywood film studios to come and, and shoot movies there. So this was the time of Ava Gardner and Frank Sinatra um, and Marlon Brando and Betty Davis. They were all in Spain, and as well as American diplomats and military generals, and, and they all stayed at the Castellana Hilton. And you, you might think that the very first Hilton Hotel in Europe was in London or Paris. It wasn't. It was in the, during the dictatorship in Madrid. And so that is the setting of the story. Um, Franco died in 1975. Um, and then Spain had to embark upon the Herculean task of transitioning to democracy which can you imagine this? They were, of course, concerned that the country might be plunged into another civil war. And so they adopted what is known um, as the Pact of Forgetting. And they agreed to, to move on without trying to prosecute those who had committed offenses um, during the dictatorship. And this just really brought up the question that inspired the novel, um, does silence truly heal pain or, or does it just prolong it. Um, those of you who know my books, you know that I feel like silence, it steals the opportunity for human connection. Because when we know someone's story, even a country's story, I think we can better understand their motivations. And when we don't know their story, we're constantly misjudging one another, and we miss that chance for connection and progress. So every nation has wounds and painful history. But when stories of conflict, like I write about, are, are read and discussed, maybe we have an opportunity to be united in story and study and remembrance. And maybe the more we know of another's country, of another country's history, you know, maybe the more meaningful and respectful our relations might be. So my hope with the Fountains of Silence um, is that maybe this novel will inspire conversations. Um, you know, because history and hardship, it, it won't disappear. But through studying the past, perhaps we can come to a point where history no longer stands between us, but flows through us. So that's what I am hoping with the Fountains of Silence, and I am hitting the road as of October 1st. These are my public tour dates. I would love to see any and all of you. Um, I will also be at ILA, NCTE, PNBA in Portland, and the Heartland Fall Forum in Cleveland. Um, and this is where you can find me. So thank you so much for having me today. Ruta, thanks so much. Um, next, we're going to talk with, or actually hear from, Julie Berry. Julie Berry is the author of the 2017 Prince Honor and Los Angeles Times Book Prize shortlisted novel, The Passion of Dulce, the Carnegie and Edgar shortlisted, All the Truth That's in Me, and many other acclaimed middle grade novels and picture books. She holds a BS from Rensselaer in communication and an MFA from Vermont College. But now she's on the West Coast in Southern California with her family. Julie? Hi, Polly. Thank you so much for having me here. And, and thank you to all the other authors who are here. It's so fascinating to hear you tell about your books and, and just, to, just to be hanging out with you. I wish we were all together at a, an actual panel, but this is the next best thing. So. Well, thank you for coming and giving me the chance to talk about Lovely War. Um, I like to describe Lovely War as an epic, mythic, World War I ragtime love story. And if we were meeting in person and there were a piano in the room, I would favor you, or maybe that's not quite the right word, with some ragtime piano music because it's always been a love of mine. So music is a big part of the story. World War I is most of the setting of the story, um, but I will explain how World War II enters into it as well. It's epic because it does encompass both world wars, and it's mythic because it involves Greek gods. Now, it's fun when I get to talk to students in schools, and, and I ask them about Greek gods, and they all know they're Greek gods, thanks to Percy Jackson. And so the way this story opens is actually with some gods in a hotel room in Manhattan in 1942, so right in the height of World War II. In fact, I'll introduce you to them here. So we have in the middle Aphrodite, the goddess of love. On her right, our left, is Ares, the god of war. And next to him 
is Hades, Lord of the Underworld. On Aphrodite's left, our right, is Hephaestus, a god of the forges and the fires, and her husband, and Apollo, the god of music. So the setup is that Aphrodite and Ares meet up at this hotel for what looks like a romantic tryst, and the bellhop turns, who takes them to their room turns out to be none other than Hephaestus, Aphrodite's jealous husband. And of course, to make matters worse for poor Hephaestus, Ares, the lover, is his own brother. They're both sons of Hera. And so um, what follows, as you can imagine, is, is an argument and, and, and an entrapment. And if you recall from the Odyssey, uh, Hephaestus actually forges a golden net and he sets it as a trap to catch the cheating pair. And then once he's caught them, he takes them to Mount Olympus and humiliates them in front of the other gods as his revenge. So I decided to take that scene and put it in this Manhattan hotel room, only instead of traveling to Mount Olympus, what follows is a sort of mock trial right there in the hotel room with Aphrodite on trial for infidelity in what turns into a sort of debate and discussion about the nature of love. And so to plead her defense and to, to plead the importance of her work, does, does love even matter, right, in the 20th century in an age of modern mechanized industrial warfare with killing on a scale like the world had never seen before? How could love even be viable in such a world where lives are mown down like grass? And so she pleads her defense by telling not one but two love stories which took place one war previous in World War I, the Great War, the war to end all wars, which, of course, it tragically did not. So this is a, a bit of a frame story, a story within a story, with the outer story being the gods in this hotel room and this, this trial that's taking place. But most of the action does take place in the stories that Aphrodite tells us. Now, she tells most of the story of these two pairs of young lovers that I'll introduce you to in a minute. But because the story takes place during a time of war, she's really not the person who can tell us, for example, a battle scene. So she summons as her witnesses Ares, god of war, to tell those parts, and eventually Apollo, god of music, to tell the music parts, and Hades, lord of the underworld, because it is a war story after all, so he's going to be essential. So the, the mortals that we get to know in this story are these four. And ordinarily I would click through each image at, one at a time, but I'll just you know, start at the left and move on over. So we have James Aldridge on the left, and he is a young British soldier who's been enlisted for duty in fall of 1917. So he's entering what will be the final year of the war, although of course no one knows that yet. And he attends a parish dance where he meets Hazel Windicott, a shy young pianist who is playing the music for the dance. Now, neither of them are very experienced in life or in love, but because Aphrodite is telling the story, she's pulling all the strings, making sure that she, these two meet. And so we see the story from her perspective, which adds, I think, a note of humor and, and playfulness uh, to what is otherwise a very familiar story, right? Boy meets girl, they, they dance, they fall in love. And so Aphrodite puts her unique spin on it. Well, these two fall in love very quickly, and they spend every possible moment together until it's time uh, for James to leave for the trenches, at which point their relationship needs to continue through letters. And so they write to one another. And all too soon uh, after James is gone, Hazel makes the decision that she wants to um, volunteer and enlist and support the war effort herself. She doesn't want to just sit at home and, and wring her hands and hope for the best. She wants to do her part or do her bit, as they said at the time. So she volunteers with the YMCA, and she serves as a music volunteer at an American training camp in France, which is where she meets both Aubrey Edwards, our next mortal there, and also Colette Fournier, the last person on the right. Colette is a Belgian refugee who's lost her entire family to the German invasion of Belgium at the start of the war, and so as a singer, she too enlisted to entertain the troops and provide comfort and consolation to them. And uh, it's as Hazel and Colette practice music together that they meet Aubrey Edwards, who is a member of the Harlem Hellfighters Regiment in the segregated U.S. Army. He is both soldier and musician and a member of the, um, the, the world-famous Ragtime Army Band that this division had, which was led by James Reese Europe. If you look at the picture right underneath Aubrey, you see a band, and the gentleman on the left is James Reese Europe, a real figure from history who was a, a pioneering figure in early uh, jazz in America. 
um, and would have been a household name if he had not died soon after the war. So these are the two couples that we will meet. Colette and Aubrey will fall in love. Uh, Aubrey is a ragtime pianist, kind of the opposite of Hazel in her classical training. And uh, Aubrey is is significant in that he and his band really kindled the love of jazz and ragtime throughout France that, that still burns very brightly today. So with each of these four people, we get to look at different aspects of the war that fascinated me. With James, if you look at the picture below him, we get to look at conditions on the Western Front and in the trenches throughout the world and the horrors endured by soldiers who anticipated a war that would be over by Christmas. None of them understood the, the lethal power of the weaponry that, that the world had then developed. We look at what the war did to the lives of women and how volunteering as nurses and as YMCA secretaries and ambulance drivers and so many other things, and, and even bomb makers in the factories, how this actually pushed women's suffrage forward and how during or after the war, suffrage was, was earned by women in both the United States and in Great Britain because the argument that they were simply too weak mentally, emotionally, or physically for civic or public or economic life was proven absurd by their contributions. We talked a little bit about James Reese Europe and about uh, ragtime, but it's also important to look at segregation and racism and the incredible hostility levied at black soldiers from America, from the American Army, from the segregated United States, from the era of you know Jim Crow sensibilities, and, and the, the, the bitter, bitter pain it was that they had to fight against their country for the privilege of fighting for their country. And of course, with Colette, we have to remember the human cost of war and, and the devastation to communities, families, and homes, and just the, what, what loss of life does. So, so dealing with trauma is, is part of the story throughout. But of course, with Aphrodite in charge, there's a buoyancy and a resiliency in, in how love helps people get through the darkest times. I, I got to visit Belgium and France in researching this book and was so moved by the tributes uh, and the memorials and the cemeteries there. And in, as I share this book with teens especially, it's important to kind of remember that human cost. And I share this, you know, this excerpt of this poem from In Flanders Fields by John McRae because I think it's so important that that they understand that those that have gone before us are not just grainy black and white photos that don't matter anymore. They are real people who lived, who loved, who, as the line says, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders fields. And so I, I hope that through falling in love with these people, these characters who I hope will feel real and lovable, um, people can feel a deeper connection to those generations that have gone before and all that they suffered and sacrificed so that we could enjoy a better world, not a perfect one, but a better world than, than what they lived through then. So that is Lovely War. Thanks, Julie. And I will tell you, um, your book is big and I am like ready to read it again because it was um, just when, now when you were talking about it, I was going back over all of the wonderfulness in the book. Um, Next up, we're going to hear from Rachel DeWaskin. Rachel DeWaskin spent her 20s in China as the unlikely star of a nighttime soap opera that inspired her memoir, Foreign Babes in Beijing. I can't wait to hear more about that. Uh, she is the author of Repeat After Me and Big Girl Small, which received the American Library Association's Alex Award for an adult book with a special appeal to teen readers. Rachel's conversations with young readers inspired her to write her first YA novel, Blind. Rachel is on the faculty of the University of Chicago, where she teaches creative writing. She lives in Chicago with her husband, playwright Zaid Dorn, and their two daughters. Rachel and her family spent six summers in Shanghai while she researched Someday We Will Fly. Rachel? Hi, thank you so much for having me. Thank you for the lovely intro and Julie and Ruda uh, and Stacy. It's just it's such a delight to hear you guys and to think about the engines of your wonder. I think it's interesting that we all sort of start with questions. Um, I wrote Someday We Will Fly, which is a war novel set during World War II in Japanese occupied Shanghai in a community of Jewish refugees because of the two photos on this slide, I was actually in Shanghai in 2011 working on a contemporary television project when I saw the, these photos at the Shanghai Jewish Refugees Museum. And the photo on the left, the one of the four teenage boys, I stared at that photo because 
it seems to me that those boys look both like teenagers anywhere and also have the sort of hollowed out look of, of war orphans. And yet they're holding uh, table tennis paddles and they are wearing <laughs> t-shirts that have the insignia of the steward camp club table tennis team on them. And I, I thought, let me understand this. Their parents fled Nazi occupied Europe and made it thousands of miles across the ocean to Shanghai, which for them must have been devastatingly unfamiliar and difficult. And from there, they made a school for their children, and then they made a table tennis team, and then they went to the trouble to make these monogrammed t-shirts. And there was something about the icon of those monograms that seemed to me so significant in terms of the resilience that people show, parents in particular, or aunties, or whoever made the t-shirts for those boys, that I felt like it, it, it really warranted literary exploration. And so I created a teenage heroine who spends World War II in Shanghai, and I thought deeply about how her parents would have created any sense of normalcy for her, and how she would have reconciled the person she had been in Warsaw when she was still safe and publicly Jewish and okay, and the person she was in Shanghai, unmoored. And the second photo is, of course, of these toddlers, and what killed me about this photo is their rag dolls with the beautifully expressively painted faces. And again, the question driving me was, who painted the faces on those beautiful dolls for those babies. Um, so I'm thinking about Ruta's question and, and Julie's hope that, that we somehow use these historical stories to talk about a potentially better world or to understand each other. I often think about this James Baldwin quotation, which I feel like I carry in my pocket like a worry stone. Baldwin said, you think your pain and heartbreak are unprecedented in the history of the world, but then you read. It was Dostoevsky and Dickens that taught me that the things that tormented me most were the very things that connected me with all the people who were alive or who had ever been alive. And I felt deeply connected to the family I created in Someday We Will Fly, and wanted to connect contemporary readers to that context, and not necessarily to the agony of that experience, but to some of the hope that that agony engendered. That ridiculous photo on the left is me on a bike share in Shanghai, and the building behind me is the embankment building where I lived for those seven summers that I spent in Shanghai researching. The embankment building was the processing center for Jewish refugees throughout the war. It was the first place that the trucks took them. And it's the first place the truck takes Lilia and her dad and her devastated baby sister. Her mom doesn't make it to Shanghai because one of the questions for me, even before this became such an acute conversation in America, was what happens to families who are separated by forces out of their control? What happens to us when we lose our moms or lose our babies at borders? And of course, over the last couple of years, this conversation has become even more agonizing in America. So it's something to consider. This is a, a three-dimensional street map from the Refugees Museum, which I used to get the intersections right. I'm a big lover of proper nouns. I wanted the names of the roads to be correct, and I needed to have a detailed map in my mind of Shanghai. Ruta, I was interested in your comment about the books that come from within you and the books that you have to research first. I, I normally write my books because I know the stories and then I do the research, but like, like your experience, for this book, I felt like I could not imagine Lilia's experience landing in 1940s Shanghai without a very vivid three-dimensional idea of Shanghai in my own mind. And so it took me years and years just to create that context and then to parachute her into it and watch how she coped. Um, these are houses which are almost unrestored still in Shanghai. And these are paper dolls I found during my research, German paper dolls mailed to a German Jewish girl by her grandmother who was in Berlin when she sent them and who later died in a concentration camp. And I think they're stunningly beautiful and devastating. And the one on the left is wearing a girl guide uniform. I found the diaries also of this German Jewish girl and read them. And she was in a, in a Girl Scout troop essentially called the Girl Guides. So I have that photo. And these are other objects I found. That's her Girl Guide notebook in the middle there. And these are poems written by the refugees and a painted wallet and a ring that one of the refugees made and a Passover menu and a picture of Jewish refugees in an alley where they tried to start a restaurant. And so imagining the lives of, of real human beings who lived through this era in, in Shanghai gave me uh, a giant and elaborate fictional world. And then this is a real picture of Shanghai, but it, it 
for me, it's my imaginary gift to Lilia because Lilia is an acrobat. She's a circus kid, and she's aerial a lot of the time. She flies. She does silk. She does trapeze. And she wants desperately to have a transcendent view, to get above her own situation in a way I think we all want. So that's the view of Shanghai that she wished for, taken from the Shanghai Tower on an iPhone, anachronistic for her, but convenient for me. Yeah. So I just wanted to say one final thing about historical fiction, which is that I think it's an antidote to propaganda. And that's because it asks rather than answers, because it complicates rather than simplifies, and because it wonders rather than asserts or pushes. And so Someday We Will Fly came out of my wonder about how human beings survive, how we thrive, and how we avoid becoming either our worst contexts or victims of those contexts. And finally, how we do the right thing as a nation or, or as, a, as a place with borders and, and the question about whether we're doing the right thing uh, right now. Thank you so much, Rachel. Um, that's incredible. And also, I wanted to thank you so much. I'm Jewish, and I have read a lot of things, um, and I've never heard this story. I read this story. So if you feel like you've read every World War II story um, that has to do with Judaism. Nope, you haven't. <laughs> um, I have some questions for everyone. Um, I, and I just want to thank you all again. Um, everything that you said was so incredible. Um, uh, I do have um, some questions for all of you individually, but I am going to start with one for everyone. Uh, it is, you all write incredible, indomitable young women, many of whom are from marginalized populations in some way. People might consider writing strong-willed, diverse women during historical time periods with stricter gender or racial expectations to be, quote, unrealistic. How do you respond to that? Um, we're going to go in reverse order, and I'm going to ask Rachel this one first. Well, it's funny. So 25,000 Jewish refugees survived World War II in Japanese-occupied Shanghai. And I often thought while writing, of course, Lilia is one imaginary character from that era. And she is marginalized and she's persecuted and she has no mom. Uh, for the moment. She's waiting for the duration of the book to see if her mom makes it. And she's very scrappy and she's not a perfect person. She behaves badly sometimes and sometimes her mistakes are very costly for her friends, particularly her Chinese friend. But I think that women have always behaved all the way across the range of possible behaviors. And that teenage girls in particular, both historically and in terms of contemporary our contemporary vision or conversation get a lot of attention for the, the tragedies that befall us, but we don't often get adequate praise for the resilience that we show in those, in those moments. And so it's not possible to, to get rid of my contemporary lens when I write. I'm a modern person, um, but I'm, I'm aware of it. And I feel like I tried to equip Lilia with both the scrappiness and intelligence and practical grit that I see in so many teenagers and also some kind of restrictions that were true to her era. And in some way, um, having, to, having to restrict your character or having to hold her inside of a context that's difficult creates good dramatic tension and a good engine. All right, awesome. All right, Julie, do you have anything to add to that or something different? Sure, yeah, and I think Rachel said it very well. I, I think part of the problem is that our collective general understanding of aspects of history are, are so colored by what we learned in high school or, or even college, um, but that often takes a very um, an academic slant that generalizes. And so it creates this mm -hmm. monolithic picture of what it meant to be a woman in the 19th century or the first half of the 20th century or the 13th century. And, um, and well, well, there's 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 truth there's validity to those generalizations they they break down in a hurry when you look at the actual lives of actual people and it, and even you know researching the passion of dolso which is set in the 13th century uh, i was mesmerized by how the exceptions seems to outweigh the rule or perhaps it's that exceptions are more likely to make history uh the, the historical record um but you can find every kind of um 
spit and vinegar <laughs> in women in all <laughs> periods of history. You can find every kind of rebellion and, and violence and, and misbehavior and, and, and courage and grit and good behavior, bad behavior, depend, however you slice it, however you view it. You find striking, stunning individuals when you look at actual histories of actual lives. So I, I think it's really important to be cautious um, about about succumbing to those generalizations and buying into those mythologies that, you know, we were all Stepford wives in the past. Now, now that said, I mm -hmm. think there, there is a, there is a risk that you can, you know, tuck totally modern sensibilities and, you know, I, I don't know, 21st century idioms and, and values and, and patterns of mm -hmm. thought, put them in a period dress and, and say that you've written historical fiction. Um, maybe I'm, you know, this is something I care so much about because I want so much to, it, it, to the extent possible, get into the minds and values and worldviews of people from the past that I study. And I, I don't want to confess to what Rachel very wisely admits that, yes, I, I too am a modern, but I'd like to believe <laughs> that I actually somehow <laughs> managed to <laughs> write from a past perspective. It's, it's, my, little, it's my little fantasy. But, but yeah, it, <laughs> I'll stop there and let wiser heads take it from there. <laughs> <laughs> well, Ruta, what do you think about that? Uh, I'm I'm just going to echo what Julie and and Rachel said um, in terms of these portrayals of women being perceived as as unrealistic. Um, as Rachel said, I, you know, I have met resilient women. As Julie said, I have met stunning women. When I was researching. Uh, my first novel, Between Shades of Grey, which tells the story of um, Lithuania's occupation by the Soviet Union, um, an entire generation of men were, were killed, and it was left to the women uh, to carry their country forward, to preserve the language, to save their children, to save the country. And what these women endured is Maybe it's poor people say unrealistic because we, we, in our comfort, we simply can't fathom the courage and fortitude and the force of life and power of love that, that can reside in us and that when we face these hardships, it's, it's how we face these hardships. And that's what these women are teaching us. Um, so I, don't, I think it's, it's absolutely mind-blowing, um, but not unrealistic. Every time I research a novel, I meet uh, more incredible, you know, women, for sure. <laughs> We're so glad that you do it. Um, okay. <laughs> Daisy, um, what else? I know, I know it's always hard to go last because everybody's already said stuff, but what, what are you thinking about this? Well, amen to everything my um, esteemed colleagues have just said, but I'm just trying to give an example of how your question um, has operated in my own um, authorly experience. Before my second book, Outrun the Moon, was published, a historian who read an early draft told me that it is unrealistic to think that a Chinese girl living in 1906 San Francisco um, would have dared to enter a white school, which is in a nutshell what that book was about. And to that I said, it might have been unusual, but unless you're familiar with every single Chinese girl living in San Francisco in 1906, you can't say that it's unreal. In fact, it actually did happen. Um, in the case of Tate versus Hurley, which is a case that went before the California Supreme Court in 1884, well before <laughs> 1906, where the Supreme Court actually found the Chinese girl had the right to enroll. Though, you know, the legislature responded by creating a separate but equal school for Chinese. And we all know how well those work out, right? So while it's true, we have to keep in mind um, that the societies that have shaped our heroines operate under different rules than ours. I think strong women have existed, as the others have said. Um, since Eve broke the rules and ate the apple, I think. Plus, I think strength doesn't have to look like what we think it looks like today. Um, we may not have a character graduating from Harvard or, you know, being a Marvel hero, but we could have a character who writes anonymous letters, for example. I think women show their strength in many different ways, and compelling stories because they are remarkable for their time. Fantastic. Um, 
Thank you so much. Actually, uh, Rachel wanted to respond to something that you said, so I'm going to go ahead and open that up. Stacy, I'm so glad that you that you said that example because one of the kind of arguments that I've had over and over about uh, someday we will fly is about whether it's whether it's unrealistic that a, a Jewish refugee girl would have had a deep and meaningful relationship with a Chinese boy, and I feel two ways about it. Both are belligerent. One is that if you have 25,000 refugees living in a, in a tiny ghetto in a giant city, they will have with their compatriots and neighbors every possible kind of relationship. They go to school together, they use the lending libraries together, they start businesses together. I'm sure they had many arguments. I think in some cases the relationships were what people have described to me, which is transactional. But I also think I applaud you because I feel like when we write novels and put meaning into the world and ask our questions, the, this is the second way I feel about it. What you have to ask yourself, what story do you want to tell? Do you want to tell the story of the transactional relationship between Jewish refugees and their Chinese neighbors? That's not really a story I would tell, even if it were accurate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I think that's one of the, the points I to make in the downstairs girl is that the legislature cannot legislate love. It happens whether or not it, if you want to, or whether or not you like to think that it doesn't. It just happens. People are right. people. They're going to behave like people, and they have since the beginning of people. So. Yeah. So, Ruta, you wanted had something you wanted to add to that? Yeah, I, I wanted to add to that um, that Rachel. One of the many things that I loved about someday we will fly is the community of refugees that you you portrayed in the book and, and you know, jumping onto what Stacy said and what's depicted in all of our books, like the capacity to love, that is the very essence of being human. And so I, I argue when someone says, is that realistic? Um, yes, it is realistic because we meet ourselves through loving and learning to love. Um, and I think all of your books, um, you know, whether it's Joe and Nathan or Hazel and James or, you know, Lilia, um, and is it Way? Is that how you pronounce it, Way? Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. it, yeah, it, I think that's, that's so important. So I just applaud you all that you have portrayed that so beautifully. Well, this is why we read all of the books, because like you said, um, you know, you haven't read this particular story or that particular story about this person. and. Um, I'm so glad that you, as um, you know, historical fiction writers, do that research to dig up those stories that you know that people think they think they're unrealistic because those stories have never been told, and those stories were always there. And you're recapturing the stories that hadn't been told, and I really appreciate that. Um, all right, I'm gonna I'm gonna see I'm checking the time. I think I I think we can go around and maybe do one question for each author. Um, and then we'll see if there's more. So for Stacy, I wanted to ask you, um, and a little bit you, you all touched on this. Um, so you you talked about many difficult topics for this book, the Chinese Exclusion Act, Jim Crow, suffrage, sexism, racism, miscegenation, um, and yet the story really remains about Joe Kwan. And so uh, you know. Um, how difficult is it to stay true to the historical realities of those really hard things, um, nod to the issues that still affect people today, but, you know, write us a story where we really care about a 17-year-old girl's crush? Because I cared. <laughs> well, I, I'd like to say I think the beauty of historical fiction is that it gives reluctant history learners a way in through the personal story. I would not have known about the stolen babies, for example, in the Franco regime without Ruta's book, or that there were refugees in China, European refugees in China because of Rachel. And then Julie's book covers World War One, which, you know, we don't really hear enough about. I don't feel we don't get enough World War One stories. So for me, the way I do it is to remain really focused, tightly focused on the personal story. Um, for me, The Downstairs Girl was probably the most research intense story I've had to do because there were so many different issues at the same time. The story is set in the Gilded Age, uh, a very turbulent time of rapid growth and industrialization. The 
gap between the rich and the poor is growing exponentially. Blacks are being stupid all the right. of reconstruction. You mentioned the Jim Crow laws on the rise. And of course, women were seeking political equality. So I think about what all those issues would have meant for a Chinese girl with no power or voice. Um, for example, an issue that would have affected her on a daily basis might have been the street cars, which she had to take to work. How would segregating the street cars affect someone who was neither black nor white? So being the sweetie empowered to the way in on these matters, um, as for her crush, <laughs> I think it's important that when you're dealing with serious subjects, uh, you balance it with something light, however you choose to do that. For me, Jo Kwan likes to keep a sense of humor about herself. She loves to play with words. And she falls in love. Um, and all these things are meant to keep the story relatable and real. My Don, thank you. Um, I'm going to go to Ruta now. And I um, want to ask about this. Uh, I'm glad that you mentioned this because I felt embarrassed that I didn't know anything about um, the Spanish Civil War and Franco's regime. Um, so, um, you know, the regime and the stealing of children, um, why do you think that this, the regime and its atrocities have largely escaped our notice, um, at least in the United States? Maybe it's more well known abroad and you can tell us that. I think there's a couple contributing factors um, about why we perhaps don't know more about the Franco regime. Um, there, there are many who believe that Franco did a lot of good in Spain, and then there are others who believe that, no, he didn't. Um, however, as of the 50s, when the United States, when we entered into um, diplomatic uh, negotiations and business with Spain, to Americans, Spain seemed like a tourist destination, a land of sunshine and wine and flamenco. So if we could travel there freely without any problem, I think that that was the perception to, the perception to Americans, um, that it was fine and it was open and, and everyone there was happy, weren't they? <laughs> well, it was only when I started reading um, the, the diplomatic archives of these U.S. diplomats who were in Spain that I realized, wow, there are so many different um, points of view. And with regard to the issue of, of stolen children, that is something that is still contested to this day. Um, there are some DNA you know, databases that have, are being set up and they're attempting to be set up to solve these questions of, you know, of identity. Um, but I think mainly because the U.S., we were sort of in business with Franco, um, that it, it just didn't seem uh, like a threatening re regime, as it did to other countries who refused to do business with Franco. Okay, yeah, and then it's just never been recorded since then. <laughs> just not a thing that we talk about anymore. Well, so, I, thank I have you to say running. that there's, there's an amazing um, biography of Franco by Paul Preston, and um, I think all of us will say that our work just sits on the shoulders of, you know, nonfiction and memoir and testimony and, and um, first-person accounts. But Paul Preston has written an incredible um, definitive biography on Franco. And of course, um, Adam Hochschild wrote Spain in Our Hearts. So there's some great nonfiction stuff out there. Great. Thank you for that. All right, Julie, um, I, you know, it's, super clear that you did painstaking research for many aspects of your book and you've referenced actual events and real people when you could. Um, why then did you choose Greek gods to tell the story? How was that inspired? <laughs> well, I knew that I wanted to tell a love story set during World War I. That was the, the challenge going in. And I, I made many false starts and many bad beginnings as I tried to find the best avenue into such a story and the best character to follow. And you know, as, as I'm researching, I'm trying to start the writing, and it's just not going anywhere. And I realized that my problem was one of point of view, and that um, a, a love story, an intimate love story by its nature, demands an intimate point of view that brings us very close to the lover, something that allows us to really get inside their, their, their you know, their breath, their their feelings, their, their skin, their you know every every little physical detail, and that that close close perspective, which is one of the pleasures of a romantic story, would actually be a limitation in terms of 
giving the wider picture of the war that I really wanted to give. And so I, I tried to think about unconventional ways of narrating this tale. And it occurred to me that perhaps love personified could be my storyteller. But then I realized love personified is not the voice you would choose for a battle scene. And so then I thought, well, maybe we need love personified and war personified. And I went, wait a minute, we already have them. <laughs> they already have names and they are already secret lovers. And, and it was just, you know, a hot diggity dog from that point on. It, everything just <laughs> blew. And so it was very accidental. But um, I think every, every story that you want to tell um, poses a, a particular set of challenges. You know, I mean, every book is a challenge to write, but every book has a specific thorny problem in the middle of it. And often I think that thorny problem is the key if you persist to finding what can be the really special potential opportunity for that book. So I think point of view was my thorny problem and, you know, divine intervention was my answer. And uh, so, <laughs> so that's how the gods came to tell our story. Excellent. Well, you did a fabulous job of getting in that point of view because I will tell you I cried more times than I have recently reading a book, reading this one. So, oh, um, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> I mean, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was good. Um, okay, Rachel, I, I want to ask you, um, you've spent a number of years in China, both as a child and an adult, and then several summers um, they're researching this book. Um, six summers, you said. So, but did the did the recent immigrant crisis in the U.S. inform or change anything about the final version of your book? You know, it's funny. By the time the conversation had become as acute as it now is, the book was finished. But I feel, I, and I've been thinking deeply about this because, of course, now the conversation feels as urgent as it ever has, and my desire to be radical in that conversation is intense and intensified and I think the conversation I've had about the book has has been transformed by the conversation that we're all now having in America but one thing I'll say is I was teaching in Greece uh, the summer of 2015 and there was of course a terrible humanitarian crisis mm -hmm. um, a refugee crisis there the Syrian refugees just desperate families and I was thinking about displaced people all of my work is about sameness and difference and people who are on the peripheries of communities or places or worlds they'd like to be on the inside of. People trying to get across the borders that threaten to divide us. And so in some sense, Someday We Will Fly was a very literal examination of those questions. And of course, Shanghai offers up an example of a country where for many complicated reasons, some of them heroic, some of them bureaucratic, they got it right. They let those Jewish refugees land, and America during World War II famously did not get that right. We dispatched the ships mm -hmm. back across the ocean, and people were, were lost. People were murdered, children, parents, families. And so I think again about those numbers, 25,000 Jewish refugees who survived because they were allowed to land safely. And I, I want to say this is a template for how we might approach offering refugees a haven um, instead of, you know, cages or concentration camps, for example. Right. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, that was interesting because when I, when I read it, I felt, I felt that you were answering things that were being asked last week on the news. And I thought like how incredible that you'd been working on this for so long and it was so um, of the moment. So, um, let's see. We've got two minutes left. Um, I think what, if we've got a quick, like if you could do a very quick, um, so for everyone, I just want to ask, um, you know, the, the famous quote, those who cannot remember the past are doomed to repeat it. Um, what history lesson would you most want readers to take away from your book, like a sentence? Um, we'll go Ruta first. Oh, okay. Um, I would ask the question again. Does, you know, does silence about history, um, does that heal pain or, or just prolong it? Okay. Julie, how about you? The question was what, what question would we want? Uh, I just want what, to make sure I'm... What history lesson, yeah, what history lesson would you most want readers to take away from your book? Mm. Well, um, 
oh gosh, there's so much going on, right, in a World War One story where where segregation and racism are also such a factor. Um, I, I guess what I how I close my presentations about it is just to say we can do better than this. We can do better than to um, choose to solve our problems with weapons and hatred and and systematic injustice. And, and we we can do better than this. And we can we can find ways to allow words and music and art and you know brotherhood and sisterhood of mankind to bring us together. Cool. All right, uh, Stacy, what would you want readers to take away? Um. I think I'd like them to remember that Chinese people are also a part of the American story and have been for generations. And the same is true for Blacks, Native Americans, Mexican Americans, and many other groups. But we don't get enough of their stories in our history books. And without them, we can easily lose sight of what has really made this country a birthplace to live. That was a long sentence. But. <laughs> That's all right. Uh, Rachel, you get the final word. I just hope that everybody feels liberated to write your books, to to tell the historical stories that are your family stories or your imagined stories. I know we talk a lot about what what histories we're allowed to say and what's what's true and what's accurate and what's realistic, but I think we have an obligation to imagine and a responsibility to tell stories both that are our own stories and that are very far from our own experiences toward having more empathy across the the chasms that threaten to divide us. Wonderful. I just, again, I want to thank all of you so much for that. Um, this conversation was really wonderful. Thank you. Thank well, you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. This is Rachel Weiss from Penguin. Um, I just wanted to Jump in, say thank you, Polly, Ruta, Stacy, Julie, and Rachel. This was an incredible conversation. Um, and if anyone has any questions or requests, my email is up on the screen, rweiss at penguinrandomhouse.com. Please uh, send me any thoughts, questions um, that you have, and I'll make sure it gets to the right person. Thanks so much, guys. <laughs>